Hi, this is Eric Boyce, CEO and Chief Investment Officer for BKA Wealth Consulting, and welcome to Market Minutes for October 26th, 2020. Please see our disclaimer for important information. Well, we certainly do have a lot to talk about this week. Um, obviously, we've had uh, some interesting action in the market in advance of the election. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about valuations, maybe a little bit about holiday shopping, a little bit about China. Obviously, we've got a resurgence in uh, coronavirus cases around the globe, not just here in the U.S., uh, a fairly pronounced um, outbreak in Europe, uh, which I think everyone is looking at as that next big wave of infections and, uh, you know, really some other things on the near term horizon uh, and some other observations that uh, I picked up here in the last week that I think, you know, continue this theme of guarded optimism with regard to the market, but being cognizant of, uh, uh, of uh, risk factors on the margin. So uh, let's jump into it, shall we? So last week, the Dow was down slightly, almost a percentage point. The S&P 500 was down half a percent. The NASDAQ was down over one percent. NASDAQ uh, was on a four week winning streak and that ended last week. Uh, but, you know, the market is just kind of stuck in this ball of uncertainty related to the election, uh, stuck in this ball of uncertainty related to stimulus talks. Uh, and, you know, I think there's, a, you know, a fairly pessimistic tone on, on being able to get stimulus done before the election. I think that's that's a foregone conclusion. Now, whether or not you get it in any kind of a perhaps a lame duck session, uh, if you assume that Biden, if the polls are correct and Biden wins and you probably not uh, don't get anything in the lame duck session. Uh, but then, you know, but there are prospects of large stimulus next year. So um, so, you know, just uh, some uncertainties, some unknowns on the margin. Uh, but in the meantime, earnings season has actually been pretty good. Uh, now, a lot of these estimates were ratcheted down quite a bit to be fairly pessimistic. And so the bar admittedly wasn't set terribly, terribly high for companies to beat. But uh, we've had about 135, 140 companies uh, report uh, through the end of last week and almost 84 percent have beaten their forecast. And the long term average is about 65 percent. Uh, average uh, earnings uh, have been about almost 18% above expectations, and that's well above the long-term average. Uh, but uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's been a mixed bag because some, uh, uh, some companies that, you know, should benefit from uh, the COVID environment, you know, have a really, really uh, high bar to, to set. You know, if the expectations are set pretty high and they disappoint, then those those stocks are getting hammered. Uh, but uh, then there are other stocks that have, you know, been known to be impacted by COVID and, you know, their bar is fairly low. So you've seen a lot of companies with very minimal expectations actually do fairly well uh, post uh, earnings release uh, because, frankly, the bar was set pretty low. Uh, but let, you know, let's talk about, you know, year to date, you know, kind of bring you up to speed that we need to talk about the bond market a little bit. Uh, S and P 500 for the year is up about 7.3%. Dow Jones for the year is down slightly about seven tenths of 1%. NASDAQ is up about 28%, almost 29%. The Russell 2000, which are small caps, uh, are down about 1.7, but small caps have really done uh, quite well, relatively speaking, here as of late, and, and we might mention that here in a second uh, too as well. But um, but international stocks defined by the uh, MSCI EFA index are down seven and a half percent. Emerging markets are up two percent for the year. So you get into the bond market, uh, the Barclays Aggregate Index, which is kind of a glom of you know just about everything that you can think of. Uh, is up about 6.4 and even high yield, interestingly enough, is outperforming the Dow Jones. High yield is up 2.2% for the year. Uh, and then looking at uh, the dollar, dollar is down about 4% and we've given up a little bit of steam this month. It's down about 1.2% for the month of October. Uh, gold has been kind of trading in a range about $1,900 an ounce. Uh, it's up about 25% for the year. And then crude obviously has been kind of whipsawed with the gyrations and in, uh, in demand as well as uh, supply. And uh, it's down about 35% uh, for the year uh, in terms of uh, 
uh, West Texas Intermediate Crude. Ten-year Treasury is something I want to talk about here for just a brief second. So the ten-year Treasury ended last week at 84 basis points, or 0.84 percent, uh, and has been trading in a really tight band of like 65 to 70 to maybe even slightly above, you know, like close to 75 basis points. And so this is reflective of, you know, a fairly uh, meaningful uh, breakout, if you will, here as of late. And, uh, you know, I, I think the bond market is uh, anticipating some things. It, it appears to be anticipating, you know, more stimulus coming uh, and, and pricing in a democratic sweep and that you're going to get that, uh, you're going to get that bump. Um, and, uh, and and uh, that obviously you're going to you know get more you know supply of bonds, which is uh, driving the prices lower, and then their corresponding yields higher. And so you're beginning to see some kind of read through on that. And I think that you know I, I think it would be very um, uh, premature to bet that that trend is going to continue in earnest. Uh, but anyway, there are puts and takes on the bond market. And basically, if, if you get rates to continue to increase, uh, you know, low rates have, have pushed investors into stocks, kind of like there is no alternative or TINA. Uh, and, and it's been a huge support to the mortgage market. And we know that real estate has done exceptionally well uh, this year. And a lot of it has had to do with the fact that we've had these you know, historically low uh, interest rates. And so not that, you know, going from 0.7 to 0.9% uh, uh, is going to, uh, you know, kill that rally, but it, it you know, it, it obviously would take off some, some steam, but, you know, the housing market, we know uh, we've got inventories at 2.7 months, uh, which is just about as low as we've ever seen it. Uh, and so, you know, a rate increase, I think, might take a little bit of steam out of the stock market, perhaps, uh, because then there would be an increasing alternative to uh, to equities uh, and then might take a little steam out of the housing market uh, and the refinancing, so on and so forth. And um, so uh, we'll just have to, to watch what happens in, in the bond market. But we're clearly getting a steeper yield curve, which is actually, frankly, good for the financial stocks. Uh, that typically need that. But uh, in any case, um, you know, looking at uh, last week, you know, the markets were mixed pretty much around the globe. You know, a surge in COVID cases uh, is, is something that's weighing on opinion globally, not necessarily here because we're focused on the election. Uh, but, you know, earnings, we've talked about that, beating expectations, um, you know, fixed income, we've talked about you know, that breaking out of that tight, you know, 20 basis point range that we've been kind of stuck in for quite some time. And uh, and then on commodities, we did talk about uh, crude and, and basically end uh, distillate products like gasoline. Uh, we continue to run 10 percent demand level demand levels, 10 percent below a year ago. Um, you know, we talked about housing. Existing home sales were up 9.4 percent in September. And that was basically 14 to 15 percent above pre-COVID levels and the highest level that we've seen since 2006, which was on the eve of the prior financial crisis, which had a lot to do with, um, uh, you know, the, the lax, laxity in the, uh, um, in, in the lending markets. Uh, but, you know, housing starts um, and it is almost close to the cycle high. And uh, labor market, interestingly enough, which had really kind of stalled out, um, maybe showed a glimmer of improvement last week. But I'm, I'm still skeptical that it's a it's a trend, it's it's habit forming, just because everything we've talked about with regard to permanent job losses and tr and stress within the small business sector. Uh, but the good news is, on a continuing claims basis, uh, we are uh, continuing to see uh, some fairly uh, good uh, traction there. But you know, as we kind of look at the, the, you know, the overall picture, you know, we know that the recovery pace is slowing. Uh, and I really think that, you know, that, that our uh, long term, our intermediate term prospects rather are, are fairly reliant on getting more fiscal stimulus uh, and a medical breakthrough on the virus uh, vaccine. And, you know, I, I think we're at risk of being disappointed uh, in some cases, and the market doesn't like that. And uh, so I think we need to be 
you know, cautiously and perhaps guardedly optimistic to uh, to overall uh, market health, but be uh, aware that we could be, you know, subject to fits of disappointment out there. And, uh, you know, when you get a few more weeks down the road, obviously we're going to have more uh, clarity in the political front. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of optimism being priced into the market with regard to the development of vaccine. Uh, and if you pay attention to my uh, charts of the week, I have uh, this week, I went back and I included that uh, transition line of uh, drugs that are in various uh, phases of, uh, of study. And we have six therapies that are approved for a limited use uh, that, um, that uh, you know, obviously driving a lot of uh, optimism right now, but you've got to get that in through the phase three clinical trials. You have to have it uh, be able to be mass produced. And so you can have widespread inoculations and so on and so forth. And that's just, that's just going to take time. And I don't think the market is properly pricing in the length of time it's going to take to get there, especially amidst the backdrop of this resurgent wave of infections globally that, that, that we've seen. But, um, but ha having said that, um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, maybe a green shoot there in the labor market temporarily. I wouldn't get too excited about that. We talked about the housing recovery. Uh, that's been a huge um, uh, win behind the, uh, the economy. Uh, I can't tell you how important that the housing has been to, uh, to the economy uh, here as of late. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the, to the degree that we are able to keep mortgage rates low will be good uh, there. Uh, the consumer, we've talked a lot about the consumer. We've had some really uh, strong uh, numbers out of the consumer. And we know that that, that those strong numbers are, uh, you know, you have to, the devil is always in the details. And we know that stimulus payments for people with lower incomes were rolling that right back into the economy. Uh, people at higher incomes were saving that. And so uh, now that we've, exited a lot of this stimulus and those checks have largely gone away. The question is, with small business struggling, with permanent job losses, are we going to see a retrenchment uh, in spending? And so, you know, as we look at their article in Barron's about holiday uh, shopping, and even though we saw kind of a bump in September, which is positive, um, you know, holiday sales are expected to fall 10 to 12 percent. And, you know, what's left, we know that more of it's going to go online, um, you know, soft line goods, which are clothing, uh, et cetera, uh, are, are going to probably be soft. And, um, you know, surveys clearly suggest that people are going to be affected this year in terms of what they spend for, uh, for, for the holidays. And, and we haven't seen that since the financial crisis uh, 12 years ago. And uh, so, you know, this is something that, you know, as we get closer to that, you know, the Black Friday or whatever, uh, that it's going to become more and more important because so many retailers are, you know, have been banking on this to help bail them out this year. So consumer sector, we got to keep our eye on that. Um, we've talked about the economic recovery overall slowing, uh, you know, interest rates, you know, could move. Higher, it's good for savers, bad for borrowers. Uh, in that case, uh, you know, we talked about third quarter earnings expectations. Uh, that's that's a good thing, um, but uh, you know, we, we've got uh, we've got a lot of cross currents here. So if you look at stock prices, um, and and you look at the the backdrop. Uh, we've seen some kind of some change. Um, we've had a weaker dollar. Uh, we've had a rising treasury curve, which uh, yield curve, which means that long term rates have gone up. Uh, we've had commodity prices move higher and we've had this kind of, you know, this renewed strength in small caps, which is really interesting. Uh, and more cyclical stocks and emerging market stocks have gone up. And then, you know, there's so much value pent up overseas uh, in developed markets as well as emerging markets that uh, that they yeah, you know, they just really lack a catalyst, but it's good to see emerging markets pick up. But um, so, you know, maybe we have signs of inflation. We don't know that uh, yet. Um, and we have prospects for additional fiscal stimulus. So, you know, 
yeah, I, I, th I think we could be, you know, beginning to kind of look past the election. I think the market may be beginning to assume that uh, Biden is going to win. You know, question is, do we have a blue wave? You know, another question is, even if the Democrats get a majority in the Senate, will it actually be enough given the fact that there are some moderate Democrats that are very much not with the progressive agenda that some have uh, that, you know, whether, you know, that would enable a progressive agenda to even get through. And I've, I've got my doubts on that. Um, again, not making a political statement, just making an observation on the potential for outcomes here. Um, so um, anyway, so enough of that. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, to kind of close the comments on that, I think we've got, um, I, I, you know, I, I think markets are still a little bit vulnerable again to this disappointment near term risks. Um, I think investors are pretty confident about the political backdrop, like I said, and, you know, perhaps banking on a smooth transition of power. And I think they're also banking on a huge stimulus package. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, if fiscal uh, responsibility uh, and balanced budgets, I think, have been really tossed by the wayside right now. And there's, uh, you know, if, if we don't get a big uh, stimulus package, I think the market will be exceptionally disappointed. Uh, and I think it could really hurt uh, small businesses uh, as well. Uh, but, um, so, uh, anyway, so we've, we've talked about that. Let's talk about COVID, uh, for a second. And, uh, yeah, on last Friday, the U S reported 83,757 cases, uh, new cases, which exceeded the prior high of July 16th of 77,362. And we've had almost eight and a half million infections in the U.S. and 224,000 deaths. Uh, worldwide, there have been more than 42 million cases and more than 1.1 uh, million deaths. So we've had, you know, even though the U.S. accounts for 4% uh, ish of the world's population, we've had almost 20% of the global deaths. Uh, and again, I refer to my, uh, the COVID tracker, which is on the first slide of my chart pack of charts of the week. So, you know, we've had this rise. Good news is that these therapies that are being put out, which include corticosteroids, uh, ascorbic acid, uh, you know, a as well as a uh, anticoagulant uh, type therapy. You know, I've been reading a lot about this lately that those therapies have really um, kind of uh, cur curbed the need to put people on ventilators. In fact, they found that doing that is actually more harmful than than good. And so death rates have really stalled out, even with cases going higher. And we know that death rates are on kind of a two week plus lag. And so we'll just have to wait and see if the death rate is going up. We know hospitalizations are going up. I've got a chart uh, in there about that. So, you know, there, there's some unknowns with regard to how this next wave plays out, you know, here as it gets cooler, people are inside more. Um, and obviously there are a lot of people that are pretty tired of the restrictions and ready for all this to be over. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I think it just pays to continue to be vigilant. But uh, in uh, Johns Hopkins has done, done their research, uh, case fatality rate about 2.7%. Uh, but in uh, almost 45 states where, uh, that we're, we're seeing accelerations in cases. Um, and so, you know, what does this mean? We've, we've got schools open and, you know, the, the infection rate amongst school children or school age children uh, is not that great. And certainly the death rate is exceptionally low. But you know, the question is, what's going to happen to, um, you know, what, what's going to what's going to happen you know, here over the next several months with regard to uh, you know, the need for spending, the need to help economies. And I think that's just a big question mark right now. And there's not a whole lot of impetus uh, to do this up on Capitol Hill right now. Uh, they're going to have to be shocked into it, I think. Anyway, so the International Monetary Fund said they believe that the global economy is going to contract about four and a half percent this year. 
the U.S., they expect to contract about 4.3%, uh, Europe about 8.3%, and um, so, um, and then uh, let's see, said fiscal support uh, has, for the year uh, amounts to about 12% of global GDP, basically the global economy, that's a huge response. But global debt to GDP ratios are rising, expected to move from about 83%, uh, which it was last year, to over 100% in 2022, uh, and then even higher than that in, in high income countries like the US. And we know that that debt to GDP ratio is, is going through the roof here in the US. Um, but uh, the, the other thing too, which I thought was really interesting, uh, and it is the risk of default uh, based on this and, and just the, the amount of uh, the, the substantial bet that's being placed on being able to finance our way out of this and mortgaging future generations here. IMF said uh, in advanced economies, over 40 percent of small and medium sized businesses are expected to have interest coverage ratios below one. That's below their ability through. Uh, through ordinary cash flow to pay their debt service. And that's pretty profound, uh, very profound. Uh, and then, you know, looking again, as I spend every week talking about small businesses, um, this was kind of a combination of Wall Street Journal and Barron's and Bloomberg data here. But um, so businesses with less than 100 employees uh, account for about uh, 33% of all workers in U.S. firms, um, and it's going down. And 20% of businesses that were open in January have, have actually stopped operating. And many of those are going to be not opening, basically. Um, and then, you know, these surveys continue to show that 40 to 50% of small business owners say that they're at risk of going out of business in the fourth quarter if they don't get help or we don't get back to uh, work. And, you know, they're having trouble getting bank loans because they're less financeable, uh, you know, whereas large companies are able to issue debt and, and that's not necessarily been a problem for them. And uh, so this is just something that I am continuing to uh, to to watch with uh, some some particular intrigue here. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, China announced that it was um, this third quarter growth rate was 4.9 percent. And basically, if the world did not have Chinese growth um, this year, then the uh, uh, then 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 we would be even worse than the basically the four uh, plus percent that the IMF expects us to contract. Uh, here, um, it'd probably be closer to about uh, six to six and a half percent if you didn't have the growth that China is expected to have. So, uh, ironically, we're seeing more um, defaults and more credit strain in China, uh, despite this uh, the improving conditions over there. So, uh, again, I, I don't think relations with China are going to get any better anytime soon. Uh, in fact, may get worse, uh, even if uh, you, know, you get a, a Biden victory uh, in, in, the, uh, in the White House. So that's China. And um, obviously, there's a lot to talk about China there. So we'll uh, avoid that. Um, and let's see. You know, we talked about interest rates. I think I've covered everything that I want to there and some of the risk factors. Uh, you know, so what, what are we doing in uh, portfolios. I think, um, you know, we, I think it's smart to look at inflation protection on the fixed income side. I think it's smart to look at, um, you know, to keep uh, to keep your uh, duration or your price risk low in, in bonds. I think there's still a viable um, function for bonds to play in terms of lowering your overall risk. Uh, if rates keep going up, there might be a short term trade involved there. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. And um, and I think, you know, having some type of portfolio insurance or downside protection is going to be uh, going to be key here, because I think um, the the history shows that uh, there is, uh, you know, more volatility around elections 
And certainly if, if there is a contested or a non-smooth transition of power, if you will, uh, that will cause some turbulence uh, as well. So, um, and then on fixed income too, I'd say, you know, stay pretty keen on credit, even though high yield has done pretty well this year. Um, I mean, we've got credit spreads on basically seriously junk related issues. Uh, junk, uh, triple C rated corporate bonds are actually back to pre pandemic levels, which I think just is, is just so foreign to me right now that there's uh, uh, so much risk uh, in, in a lot of that paper. Uh, it's not being priced in right now. And you know, we've got, you know, 20% of hotels or 60 days delinquent on loans and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, we've got to, uh, I think, be, be smart. I think there is a, a long-term case uh, to be made for, you know, equities, even though valuations are looking relatively full right now. Uh, and then maybe they move sideways for a while. But, you know, when we get past the election, you know, we get a little bit farther down the vaccine road. Um, I think, you know, we, we could have uh, really the, the, the mother's milk for stronger synchronized global growth and perhaps more self-sustaining uh, expansion here in the global economy. Uh, but we just don't know how that's going to play out. And the timing of it's a little bit hard to gauge right now. So uh, anyway, uh, just some just some thoughts uh, on on the market. And uh, I'd say that's that's about all I've got uh, this week. We appreciate you taking the time to listen to this and um, hope you have a wonderful week, a safe week. Uh, be vigilant uh, with these rising coronavirus cases and uh, feel free to reach out uh, at the numbers uh, and the contact information you see there. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, have a great week. Talk to you soon.